evening, everyone. I'm Don Crafton, the Interim Director of the Nanovic Institute. Thank you for being here tonight as part of our continuing series of European cinema, naturally. And tonight, I am uh, extremely happy to be able to introduce our guest of honor, um, Dr. Thomas Elsesser. Um, Thomas is a Professor Emeritus of the University of Amsterdam. He is uh, a visiting professor, um, finishing up a, a term of five years at Yale and currently teaching at Columbia in New York, and a renowned international lecturer. He counts the numbers of talks and keynotes in the hundreds, if not thousands. So we'll just be another check on the list after tonight. But we're happy. We're happy to be a check. And uh, we um, uh, are, are also celebrating the fact that his most recent book is on uh, the cultural interface of Hollywood and Europe. So it's especially apropos that he uh, be visiting us this week and um, that he has curated uh, the film for tonight, Belatar's Magnificent, The Turin Horse. Earlier this afternoon, Dr. Elsesser described the film as um, a, 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 a film that was made to be enjoyed as almost a, a cult experience, and <coughs> something to be savored and to be um, understood as, as very primal. And uh, we're very happy to offer you the opportunity for this uh, profound and uh, maybe life-changing experience tonight. Uh, Dr. Elsesser's um, many books and articles, some uh, 200 articles, uh, have been translated and reproduced many, many times. His books have been translated into 21 languages, and he uh, comes to us as um, part of a, a, a semester-long uh, exchange in which we're trying to bring in uh, the, the very best and most informative and charismatic speakers to introduce European films to us. So with that, please welcome Dr. Thomas Elsesser. Good evening. Um, thank you very much, Don, for these uh, generous introductory words. I have chosen this film uh, partly with uh, the lecture I gave uh, this afternoon in mind, which was on heroic and post-heroic narratives in the Euro of the 21st century. And I think it's appropriate that um, uh, we are watching uh, the film, reputedly the last film that this particular director intends to make uh, from a country, namely Hungary, that has recently joined uh, the European Union and is struggling with uh, uh, a very uh, convoluted and complicated past, um, finding nationhood once again after many kinds of occupations in the 20th century, and at the same time uh, harboring and having produced some extraordinary filmmakers, Miklos Jansko being one of them, and indeed Belatar. Belatar is a director that um, has not men made many films, but he has made films that have left an indelible impression on those who've seen them. And as Don already hinted at, uh, there's just a chance that if you last for the next two and a half hours, you may indeed have a life-changing experience. Belatar's films are, how shall I say, they're not for the faint-hearted. Not in the way that some uh, American films are not for the faint-hearted, but because it needs, and maybe in this sense, this ambiance is very appropriate for it, because it, you have to be of not, not only a, not a faint heart, but a firm spirit. These are journeys, his films. But they're journeys that um, are not so much journeys that the characters undertake, but journeys that you, as the audience, are invited to undertake. And uh, I will come back to this point in a little while. Uh, I first want perhaps to just 
briefly say what made me think of this film for the particular occasion that my visit to Royal Notre Dame actually represents for me. And don't worry, it won't be just a tick on my, uh, my list. It will be itself an uh, indelible experience. The film is about the last things. It's about, uh, if you like, the minimal conditions of what it means to live and survive at this point in time. But it does this in a form that may strike most of you as being set in another world, in another century, in a completely different set of coordinates than from what you're used to and also what you're used to in the cinema. But it does concern something that interests me for and with the 21st century, namely, how is it that the cinema can reinvent itself after everything that we've had, a hundred years of films, different forms of cinema, European art cinema, auteur cinema, commercial cinema, genre cinema, world cinema, cinema as second and third generation videotape cinema now on your iPhone or iPad. And, and so I think Bellata is one of those directors who sets about reinventing the cinema. <coughs> and if you have uh, a certain cinematic education, you will think of the silent cinema, you will think of Dreyer, or you will think of Murna when you see his film. It's an austere but very uh, delicate black and white. It is virtually without dialogue. And it has the luminosity that comes from a form of cinema as if the cinema that we now know from every day had never existed. So it's both a throwback to a much earlier form, but I would say it's also something, a cast forward into something that we may still remember as essential about the cinema. And it combines a particular intensity, luminosity, beauty of the individual shot there are very few camera movements and very few shot changes. You're in for very long takes. And that combines, you know, these, the beauty of those images combines with a way of thinking about the characters as not only marginal to social life, but in some sense, what I call this afternoon, abject. They have a particular way of being so marginal that their singularity and individuality radiates with a kind of sacredness. So we have the most abject conditions of life, poverty, penury, uh, people who seem to have no project, no concept of what they might want to do and where their lives might be going, if anywhere at all, and yet whose very presence, whose very existence has a kind of intensity and radiance that makes us think about what really matters uh, in our lives today. And I'm saying this because, on the one hand, Belata is perhaps the world's best known unknown filmmaker. He is known to a very small group of dedicated, if not passionate and fanatic believers in his kind of cinema, but he has driven many audiences out of the cinema as well, at festivals and as gatherings like this. And I will not place any bets of how many of you will still be here at the end of the film. But I do want to read you some of the uh, comments that have been made by critics about Turin Horse. And I'm reading three of, uh, extracts from three of, you, for, three of them for you. One is from The Guardian, The London Guardian, and uh, it goes as follows. I'm dis disappointed to hear that Bellata, today's supreme master of the serpentine take, as exemplified by his latest movie, The Touring Horse, has decided to retire from filmmaking in order to found his own film school in Croatia. My fondest hope is that he will create a fanatical 
cult-like environment wherein he can hothouse a generation of filmmakers as grouchy, misanthropic and visionary as himself. Because guys like Tar are fewer on the ground every day. We badly need to stock up on more eccentrics anxious to make movies like Tar's Turin Horse. And if you play it at 20 times the normal running speed, it becomes a knockabout comedy. No, really, do try it. <laughs> now there you see, there's a praise, faint praise with quite a sting in the tail. And I think that is, however well-intentioned, not the way that we should think about the film. Again in London, the London Independent. The film, films of the Hungarian auteur Belata often feature scenes in which characters struggle doggedly across vast windswept plains. Some might say that to watch a Belata film is to struggle doggedly across a windswept plain. And even if you're accustomed to cinematic austerity, Tar's glacier pacing can test the concentration. Yet in some ways, it's the Turin horse is the most extreme of Tar's films, and certainly also the simplest. Co-written once again by novelist Laszlo Krasnahorkai, the Turin horse is a minimalist distillation of Tar's cinema. Little more than a man, a woman, and a horse, a house, some wretched weather, and very few words. The narrative content is so slender it's barely even an anecdote, yet the film has a disturbing resonance of some ancient imponderable fable. It all begins in darkness as the narrator intones the apocryphal tale of how Nietzsche went mad, supposedly after seeing a horse beaten in Turin. After this incident, the German philosopher lapsed forevermore into silence. And a punchline? No one knows what happened to the horse. We will see in the film what happens to the horse. And finally, uh, an appreciation by Anthony Lane of The New Yorker. Here is the work of a serious eschatologist, someone who is un unafraid to dwell on the rubric of last things. Apocalypse, or its comical near avoidance, is now quite the fashion in Hollywood, and almost every villain in every superhero flick threatens to blow up, enslave, or otherwise paralyze the planet. Think of uh, Dark Knight. Even Lars von Trier has made a contribution with a thundering firestorm that rounds off melancholia. Tar considers a more prosaic extinction, one that will surprise no one who has followed his previous endeavors. Life, through his sad eyes, is a lamp that gutters and goes out. All whimper, and no bang. Not that the film does anything so vulgar as to announce the end of the world. No clock ticks down in the corner of the frame. We would, in fact, be watching nothing worse than the end of a lousy week or the winding down of an agrarian culture in one of Eastern Europe's backwaters. Yet the sense of some greater calamity from which there will be no return nags and tugs at the edges of the movie like the extraordinary wind that seems to blow throughout, forcing the characters to walk along with heads bowed through a storm of dead leaves and dirt. Most of the story unfolds within or just outside one house with a stable stuck in one desolate basin of dry ground. And most of the scenes feature nothing more than a father and a daughter. Think of the lingering fate for Lear and Cordelia in Shakespeare's play in many ways a worse one, not united in easeful death, but sent back to the blasted heath to eke out their days in bickering and silence, with a royal retinue shrunk to a single nag. So much for the critics. My thinking is that um, it is a spiritual journey that you, you are invited to undertake. And the spiritual journey that that may take you to certain points, and may take you beyond certain points, or it may actually leave you so desolate that uh, it's too much to take in in one evening. And in the first, I would say, I'll just give you my, the, the journey that I felt I was undergoing. For the first 10 minutes, I was absolutely riveted. 
There is a pace, there is an intensity, there's a sweep that you will never have seen before in the movie house. Then what settles in is the sense, yes, I'm in a film and uh, nothing will happen. So well, you have to put yourself in an entirely different frame of mind. You have to be able to open yourself up to what is essentially a spiritual exercise, a meditation. And you will be with these people, with these two people. Not, you not be looking at them, spying on them, you'll be with them. And you will have to account for yourself being with them. So in that sense, it is a self-examination of you amongst them. <coughs> and that's one moment where you will feel this is actually a Beckettian comedy. In other words, your, your mind, as it goes through these movements, will come to a point where you experience extraordinary release and relief, or I did at any rate, that this is comedy of the highest order, Beckett, Kafka, those names come to mind, at least to me, and you, you will see that this, what they saw, that, you know, uh, Belatar with the sad eyes and so on, is a comic genius. And that will actually then, again, change into something more somber, and it will happen at a point where, and I'll, I won't give away anything, but still alert you to this, where the characters do make a desperate attempt to escape from their situation. And what nearly broke my heart was the realization that the camera wasn't following them. And that was the moment when I thought, this is really a film about things that I've never thought about. And I hope that for you, it also will be an occasion for things to appear on the screen that you've never thought about. Thank you.